Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast. So we're here with your hosts, Jake Saldati and Chad Rothbard. Um, we, our guests, you can see, is uh, I know him as Murdy. <laughs> That's probably the, uh, the best way. Murdy, uh, Alec Merton, uh, went to Madera High School, Fresno Pacific, and then was drafted by the Colorado Rockies and played in their organization. Uh, how many years was it? Just a cup of coffee, I think. That was. It wasn't a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee is what I had, which was <laughs> one year and some change. Um, 2012, the Rockies with Tri-City, Modesto, and Asheville. 2013 was a Northwest League All-Star. Um, after professional career, became a coach, recruiting coordinator at Fresno Pacific University. Um, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. You're welcome, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Murdy for a long, a long time. time. Yeah. What, 13? Yeah, I think I was 12 or 13 so, when, I, yeah, when I started playing for you guys. I got to see him go through Babe Ruth and... I think I was a catcher back then, and I just uh, switched the infield because I couldn't make the throw to second base. Is that right? after Little League? Yeah, yeah. You were a catcher. I don't I, remember I mean, that. I, I, I caught in Little League just because nobody was was everybody was scared and didn't want to catch the guys that were. I'll have to ask Coxie. Hard, so. I don't. I don't remember. Yeah, he would know. He would know. Um, and then obviously through high school and and got to see you at the FPU and uh, yeah, we go way back, Marty and mm-hmm. I. Uh, I was his favorite coach, if you didn't know. Um, yeah, and I didn't. His favorite coach not to coach him, or his favorite. <laughs> He'd have to answer that for you. <laughs> uh, thank everybody for uh, reaching out after 101. Uh, gotten a lot of messages and responses from the Chris Heron episode. So thank you guys for that. And uh, again, follow us here at the Hit or Die podcast on Twitter and Hit or Die on Instagram. Uh, Murdy. There's been some news in some baseball recently. Before mm-hmm. we get into the life of Alec Merton, um, pending approval from Major League Baseball, LeBron James will become part owner of the Boston Red Sox. This week, he became a partner. Uh, I think that was last week. Not sure. Uh, with the Fenway Sports Group per the Boston Globe. Mm. Chad, you had an interesting take on this. I did. There's no ties to Boston. <laughs> that was the, it was the obvious, and it, I didn't even mm-hmm. it didn't even come across like L.A. I could see why he wouldn't maybe just because Magic Johnson sure, is there. Sure, but Cleveland's your hometown. Like, wouldn't you want a little piece of that? Yeah, I think that was the last time he's really been spotted at a baseball field. Right, it was when Cleveland was in the World Series. Yeah, yeah. that's the obvious choice. For, yeah, but I know the Boston thing's weird. The Boston thing's weird, but I mean, I get the market, mm-hmm. you know, to be in that market, but it just makes no sense to me. Boston and LeBron. I just don't. I don't. I don't see it together. Well, how are you trying to play basketball, and your focus is <laughs> well, he's becoming his, an owner? He's got his hand in so many different. Th- I mean, he has a school, and he has you know the overseas stuff, and he's making comments about China, and you know, I don't know how uh, <laughs> how crazy. You, yeah, I don't know how crazy you guys, you guys want to get with this, but yeah, I mean, I think as crazy as you want to get, Murdy. <laughs> We don't, I don't know. We don't get crazy on here very often. I don't know. I think, I mean. Or at least we just, don't We don't post the crazy. He's got a ton of stuff. So, I don't know. It's interesting. Hey, good for him though, right? I mean, he's, whatever. Yeah. Do what I mean, just, the, it's, what he's done for his community in Cleveland or Ohio or where he's from is tremendous mm-hmm. with the school and doing that and giving back to the community at 100%. Mm-hmm. He's done the right thing there. So, and he's a great basketball player. Yep. Other, uh, other than that, you know. Yeah, the, uh. The other stuff, whatever. <laughs> we'll stay out of that's that. That's an NBA thing, right? I mean, it's not just a LeBron thing. The yeah. China stuff. That's that's. And I'm not an NBA. I don't know much about. I don't follow too much about the How NBA. How dare you? I I just I don't know. It's I'm fine. Not I haven't NBA. watched a basketball game since 2019, probably. Yeah. I don't watch basketball at all. Um, but it was it was news. I just get it out there, get some mm-hmm. opinions, see what people think. I thought that was that was the obvious, and I didn't even think about it. Uh, there's no ties to Boston, mm-hmm. but whatever. Uh, big franchise uh, with a great history and a lot of winning, especially recently. So mm-hmm. why not? I just you think L.A., Lakers, maybe Dodgers. Uh, you know, I went straight to Cleveland, though. Padres making – and Cleveland, I mean, mm-hmm. that that's makes your, that's total your, sense. I mean, no matter where you play, you're always tied back to Cleveland. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you grew up there. It's where you're from. You're drafted by Cleveland, you know. Mm-hmm. One with Cleveland. So. 
Oh. And the big one was the minor league rule changes. Do you guys see this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, let's see. I saw AAA changes. The sizes of the bases will increase from 15 square inches to 18. And be less slippery, they say. <laughs> MLB expects the slightly shorter distance between bases will lead to a higher success rate on stolen bases. What? <laughs> As well as infield hits. That's why they did it? On grounders and bunts. That's this is, this three, is so for... So three inches. This is for Baseball America. From so, Baseball so America. So three inches. So I guess from first to second, it'd be six inches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're... Yeah. Come on. Really? I mean, so what are they... What's the change for? Is it, it's a, is it to limit collisions at the bases? Or is it to... See, that's what I would see. That's... Yeah. I mean, I, I, the only place that it really would matter would be at first base, right? Yeah. And I see that. I, that makes... That makes sense. Yeah, they they safer. also talked about doing like the slow pitch softball bag the off the side, bag. which I was actually okay with. Well, you had that issue being a first with baseman only Trey Turner in the postseason right, a couple right. of years yeah. ago at Houston, mm-hmm. where he was called out where he was a bad call. Yeah, I thought anyway. Well, you know the running lane is in foul territory, right. but the no part of the base is, is in, in foul, foul territory, territory yeah. right? Which makes right. no sense as well. Because now you're liable, like Jason Kendall back in the day mm-hmm. broke his ankle or, you know, hitting that edge of the bag. So I actually like the slow pitch softball rule rather than this because the three inches are still going that way. They're right. not going into foul territory right. for the base right. runner. So yeah, I still think that makes no sense. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's going to change the game, I think, very small. I mean, it's not going to do a whole lot. I was thinking on the other side of it, like, now that guy at first base, because the base is bigger now, he can stretch a little farther. So it's going to take away some of those infield hits. But I guess it's the same way for a runner being a little bit closer to the, you know, to reach out and touch the base. So I think it all evens out just a little bit. But I don't know. I don't think it's going to matter that much. Yeah, and I don't. And what kind of material are they going to use for non-slippery? Because I mean, we playing at a. I mean, from any level, the bases are pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. Um, like the material. They're only slippery when they get rainy, but other than that, they're not. So I don't know what you're going to get. Maybe like the sole of a shoe when you go, you know, like those workers with the <laughs> yeah. non-slip shoes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm, that's what I'm trying to wonder what they're going to do with that. Because that was an issue too with like Harper back mm-hmm. a couple of years ago with hyperextension off the base. So Yeah. Yeah. But the other part was the, like stealing bases. Like if you're mm-hmm. fast, you're fast. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it either. I mean, six inches, I guess. What it, the funny it, the funny thing is about that is the percentage of stolen bases like actually stolen bases per attempt are higher like that you know the the catcher what 32 percent or something of throwing mm-hmm. out base runners is really good for a catcher so if a catcher only throws out 32 percent of his runners the issue is nobody's stealing in general <laughs> because the way the game is played now is they don't want to risk him getting out to second because it's long it's long ball game Mm-hmm. So they'd rather him. He's in scoring position at first base. That's the way they're playing the big leagues now. Mm-hmm. So unless you're Hamilton or like a a really big speed burner or Trey Turner, there you're, you're not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I, that doesn't make sense either because the percentage of a catcher throwing a guy out is still minimal. Right. And again, if you're a good base stealer or, or fast, right? I don't. I just kind of it, it, MLB expects this slightly shortened distance between bases will lead to higher success rate on on stolen bases well then they should have pitchers go only leg kicks only no slide <laughs> mm-hmm. steps. right yeah i mean you know what i mean because that's who you're really stealing off right. of anyways so. and uh or you know for hitters you know maybe they start with a 1-0 count it only maybe increase more fastballs <laughs> right 2-0 count yeah we just want to make it easier <laughs> for everybody i'm just saying like we're trying why to make change? it easier for runners I mean, it to all steal comes bases. Back to why change the game mm-hmm. uh in double a changes the efforts will be made to limit the ways teams can position their infielders that's a big one all defensive teams at that level must have at least four players on the infield <laughs> i actually like this one i do too i don't mind this one mm-hmm. the shift kind of sucks i see so many guys just barrel balls up that are hits Whatever, it's annoying. It's it's strategy a strategy play. I get it, and there's no rule against it. But maybe limiting the defense to being on the dirt. I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see it both ways. I think if you want to see a more offensive game, then yeah, limit the shifts, make them stay on the infield, and then you can, you know, 
So when you were with the Rockies, were you guys? Yeah, because the shifting was a career, big. The shifting started coming in big. Yeah, we didn't use it that much in the minor leagues. I mean, we, very small. We would we would you know play some play some guys down the line, or you know maybe just short shift into the six hole or whatever. But um, and even at FPU when I was coaching there, we we used it just a little bit. But I mean, most of those guys, the probability they're not so set in there. Like there's not some dead pool, you know, big donkey first baseman that only can hit the ball in that little triangle, you know, in right center. It's like so Joey you, Gallo where you yeah, can exactly. put, you know, all exactly. eight players, you know, seven players on that side of the field. So we didn't use it too much, and you never really saw it. So I didn't I didn't have a lot of experience with it. Um, and me being a hitter, I mean, I could – I was just a kind of a slap guy to the right side anyway. So it wasn't like, you know, guys were just playing me straight up. But um, I don't know. I, I don't – I like being able to move. I, th- I think it opens up a lot of possibilities and like, the strategy thing. Um, like you're not going to tell formations in, in basketball, hey, you can only run down the court a certain way. You're going to let them play the game they want to play. So I think for the managers, let them shift however they want. And, then, and it's on the hitter. I think it's on the hitter. Hey, if, you, if you're constantly just pounding that ball into the right field and you know the second baseman's out there just gobbling up and throwing you out by 10 steps, maybe try to punch the ball the other way. I mean, and I know some guys can't do it. Um, that's on them. I think that's... No, I, I think that's a 100% accurate. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I, we like a broken whole, uh, record here, but uh, you know, that's why DJ LeMayhew is never <laughs> shifted on. And that was a guy you... That guy's ridiculous, yeah. In your organization. Did you ever have uh, any time with some of those guys? Like, yeah, you guys were loaded. The Rockies yeah. had some... What too low yeah. and their farm, their farm system's always been pretty, or generally really good. Charlie yeah. Blackman was there. You had a lot of mm-hmm. cargo. I was I was mm-hmm. fortunate enough. I was there in 09 spring training. Mm-hmm. I was there just for spring training, and there I was with Charlie Blackman that year. But they're loaded every year. But they just trade guys away, or you know they come up and they're in Colorado and they think they can't play anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, I know. you were there probably with Arenado and. Yeah, yeah. So Arenado, um, let me think, was there, I think he might have been a year. He'd already been playing a year or so, so he was starting to get established a little bit. I think he broke in thir- he, 13 was yeah. his debut. That's my that's my guy. I love I love Nolan Arenado. He, he's, I'm, a, I'm a Cardinals fan now, so right. he's, a, he's my dude. But, um, yeah, all those guys. I mean, just the way – I mean, watching Trevor Story every day, watching Blackman every day, I mean, those guys – they just go about the game a little differently. Um, and, you know, say what you want about Tulo. There's a lot of people that talk about him, how he, how he, you know, he carried himself. But he, was a, he wanted to win. And that was the biggest thing everybody said about him. And, and they all learned from him. So the intensity that they brought in the game every day was because of Tulo and Cargo and Helton. I mean, Helton was, was the guy. Yeah. So, yeah, we got to see all those guys. That, that was probably the, the best thing about spring training was that our complex was, like, all molded together. So – we were around those guys constantly and just, just a good way to see. I mean, it was a good organization just to see how they went about their business every day. Yeah. I love that stuff. Uh, high A's got some changes. Uh, pitchers will be re- required to, uh, step off. Right. Is that that one? Yeah. They'll have to disengage. Is, oh, they have to step off the mound to pick. I'm just make sure I'm reading the right one because it's got high end. Okay, high A pitchers will be required to disengage the rubber completely before throwing to any base. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so now, so now a lefty can't do. Yeah, how does that work? So now a lefty's just gonna get stolen on. And it's not even mentioned here how that works for lefties. The Atlantic League saw a significant uptick in stolen bases because of that rule. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lefty. Every it's time real. a lefty lifts his legs, you're gonna be safe. I, I mean, mean I could have got twenty bags in that league. <laughs> I mean, I might have not. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> there's possibility we we could have some stolen bases in that. <laughs> yeah, if you don't have a catcher, maybe <laughs> minus the catcher. Mm-hmm. Uh, low A pitchers will be limited to step off picks. Only two of them per yeah. batter. Yeah, two step offs. And what was it? The third uh, one they have to get him out. So two te- two step offs per plate appearance. Uh, if a pitcher tries a third pick off in a plate appearance, the move will be considered a bop. So if he picks over twice, you might as well just start getting a lead 
all the way to second base. You just, just okay, start on. walking to second base when hold they come on. set. Can't hold on. A, a, a third pickoff in a plate appearance, the move will be considered a balk unless the move is successful So you have to and pick the runner off. is picked off. That makes no sense either. <laughs> That's what it what says. I'm telling you. But then, so after the third one, this is this is major league. This is professional baseball. Yeah, that's not gonna work. Sounds so like so far, I'm, I'm only really into the shift thing, just because I think that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, well, I mean, you'd see guys batting average go up, more hits. But I do agree with Murdy, like especially those Gallo's not getting thrown in. Drive the ball to left center. Freaking, you, yeah. you have power to go the other way. Oh, yeah, for you sure. Know, stop trying to pull everything. And I think the the whole concept of a hitter is, mm-hmm. is, has gone. Mm. So. Yeah. But, I mean, that's what he's that's what he's paid to do. I mean, he's his idea of beating the shift is just hit it out of the stadium. I mean, I played against that guy my first year of pro ball, and he hit some of the furthest balls I think I've ever seen. And he was – 21 or whatever how old he was when when we were coming up that dude's a monster so i think when you have a guy like that you know then you go back to the whole thing well do you want them on base or do you want them just to try to score a run for you and that's kind of where the game you know is going which i think is a shame for a lot of reasons but um but yeah i mean you can kind of go both ways on it you know yeah uh low a west changes uh, teams will add timers to enforce time between pitches, inning breaks, and pitching changes. <sighs> it doesn't matter. I th- how much time? How I mean, how much? I mean, they get eight warm up pitches anyways. So yeah, I mean, it's not even a lot of pitches. The whole speed up thing. I was I was talking to I think I was talking to my wife about this. Actually, she has to hear a lot of my rants. Um, I was talking to her about this the other day. The whole speed up thing. I mean, if you're watching a baseball game, you know you're going to be watching it for three hours minimum. I mean, that's just kind of the general rule. It's been around long enough. People know what you're getting So the speed-up rules are going to shave off, what, five, ten minutes maybe? That's a lot if you're thinking about I mean, you're not going to cut the game down that much. The casual fan, if, if they don't like baseball, it doesn't matter how much you speed this game up. They're not going to watch. Well, if you're going to charge me what you're going to charge me for tickets and, you know, for right. a $10 I mean, soda, I want to get my money's worth. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I want uh, give me the three and a half hour game. I think every baseball, true baseball fan knows that they're going for a nine inning baseball game. It's going to take three to three and a half hours, and that's what they want. Yeah, you know, unless you have an absolute pitching, you know. Yeah, goal. yeah, and that happens. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Um, low A Southeast changes. Select games will use the automatic ball strike system. Robo umps which was tested both in the Atlantic League and Arizona Fall League in 2019. Do they have stats on that, how good it is? Um, no. So I don't get this one either. I don't I have a, a, like how many accurate and accuracy yeah. percentage of how it worked. I just remember. I've heard it's high, but I've also heard that. Well, the human they, one they is record, like 97, right, it was 97, 98%. Relatively close. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a human game. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. I don't know because as a hitter, there were there were balls like a catcher would take it down, so it looked like a ball. But the the robo got it, just nicking the strike zone, so it was a strike. And so I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I hope they never go to a, a robo umpire. I think that's just taken away from a part of the game. And is it so? It was just an umpire like a robo behind the plate guy? Or are they going to do like the ones I saw? It was an umpire that had a uh, earpiece. like an earpiece. And it would, uh, I think it would beep for a strike, and it didn't do anything if it was a ball. So if it beeped, you would give a strike. So he has to sit back there and call. Yeah, it. Well, look like a real. Yeah, so you're pretty much, yeah, <laughs> a real more. How like, bad is that as an umpire? Your oh, job's oh, being man. done for you. You're just standing there. That's embarrassing. Why? Why even get down in the stands? <laughs> why don't you just stand off the side like just a softball, like a softball umpire, or yeah. just do it from behind the strike. mound? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's inter- I'd be yeah I don't know I don't know how if that's how it's gonna work now but I'd be pretty embarrassed grab a chair yeah and sit behind the catcher <laughs> uh, well I mean they should just forget you got to have an umpire though for safe like, plays at the plate you know to to do calls it's I know but it's just funny thinking that he's back there down yeah listening for the beat and then he gets a yeah yeah I don't know interesting but but leading into that. Last or was it this week? It might have been last week. Uh, 
Luis Guillorme had a, a 22 pitch walk from the Mets mm-hmm. uh, facing Jordan Hicks, and which throws a hundred plus, by the way. But oh yeah, it's insane. Which that's so that's did even. You, have you, did you watch that. the mm-hmm. at bat? I watched it. Yeah. Did you have you seen the at bat? I saw most of it. I saw like 15 pitches of it. The dugout was jacked up. Yeah, man. it was fun. Everybody was like really into yeah. it, and it's a 22 pitch at bat. That's like, probably the where, last thing you this... want in a spring training game, by the way. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> but I mean, where's this the speed up worry there? Like, that's just fun. I mean, yeah, that's just a fun. It's just a fun at bat. I mean, my concern. I was telling this to Chad. I've noticed, and I've I haven't watched a lot of spring spring training. I'll be honest, but what I have seen. And I've been looking at box scores just to see, and, and maybe this is just me not paying attention enough over the years. But I the strikeout situation is insane. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're seeing 17 strikeouts combined a game. You're you know you're seeing 15, 16, up to 18 outs all via the strikeout, and only 10 balls put in play for outs. Mm-hmm. And then, but on top of the flip side, is you're only seeing eight to twelve hits, yeah. so they're not hitting either. I don't know. So we're, uh, I don't know. We're worried about speeding up the game, mm-hmm. but we're not worried about the product that we're putting out either. Like, yeah, I no, I mean, yeah, you're right. That's why I appreciate a twenty-two. I mean, even a ten pitch at bat, you know, all day long, take them. Yeah, and I think. A lot of people don't understand how difficult that it. That's why it was Jordan Hicks makes it more impressive. Mm-hmm. Impressive, yeah. a guy throwing one hundred to one hundred two miles an hour, probably with a ninety three mile an hour yeah. slider and an eighty five to eighty eight mile an hour changeup. I mean, it's just. I know at some point you you just you're gonna guess wrong. You right? have to, but for him just to keep fouling that stuff off and because he, like I he think was he was one two or he was o oh, two. Yeah, he was either o oh, two or like one two. Yeah, and it's like. So there's 20 more pitches or, t- or 19 more pitches that he has to foul off or take. You know, I, did he? Really I don't think, you know what I didn't look at is uh, did he, it was that was his one hitter? And <laughs> I don't know. Did was that all for his the work? pitch innings yeah. for the innings? Because yeah, that was another thing you brought up to me that they had a pitch count in inning. And they would just walk off the field. Yeah, and then come back the next inning though because mm-hmm. they had they had certain pitches in the inning. Weird. And yeah. they're doing the seven inning stuff, changing. and which is I don't mind that. Sure, for spring training, I get it. Because yeah. that actually, because I mean, who wants? No offense to anybody out there, who wants to sit around the last three innings for the minor league players to play? No, that's the worst. I mean, it's fun for the minor leaguers. Don't get me wrong; they're in a big league spring training game, but you know, just when, when, t- when the when the two helmet thing comes out, <laughs> that's, that's when it's time. Two flappers, to, yeah. yeah. When number uh, one hundred seven comes up to hit, it's, exactly. All right, son, get your, get your stuff. Let's yeah. let's go. Uh, the last thing I would notice, and I, again, I've watched, I think, a total of three, maybe four spring training games. I'm not going to say games. I've watched some of the games. Mm-hmm. Never finished them. The one knee catching, and I saw it last night in the Giants-Mariners game. I've seen four runs scored off of pass balls because the catcher's catching with one knee. Really? One thing, last night, and last night, I can't block on one knee. Mm-hmm. Last night, the Giants, their catcher was set up inside, or it was Mariners, had set up inside, it was a slider, curveball, whatever, back shoulder, but his left knee was the one, or his left leg was the one out. I mean, there's no way he could block mm-hmm. the ball to his right. Yeah. And sure enough, it skipped and run scores. He was doing that with a guy on third base? His bases were loaded. Jeez. There's, there's, I mean, I don't get it. They all are. Now. What is it? What is the point of it? What is it? What are the, what is it going to accomplish? I don't understand. I mean, the only thing I could ever think of is getting a low target, but that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. 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 You're probably right. But I mean, I don't know. I don't. Okay. All right. We're gonna, here's your target, yeah. but a run might score here just in case. No. And, and I, and I agree with that. And there are, that's just a thing now. So all the younger catchers are trying to learn how to do that. So, but who? Like, I want to know who decided it was a thing. Like, I don't what's know. the science behind it? You know, I because mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, Yachty did it a long time ago, but I've never seen Yachty do it with runners on base. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that should be a thing too. Like if nobody's on base, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, there used to be the the old school guys used to kick the leg out and you know sit on their butt and like whatever. Nobody's on base, but if a runner gets on base, you have to be in such a good athletic position to block the ball, pick it up, throw it. I don't know. I just I don't like it. And I and if the big leaguers can't even do it right, and you know how good they are already, these younger guys shouldn't be doing that. Learn how to catch, throw, mm-hmm. block. That's your job. I just don't know the purpose behind it. And if it's for one thing, if it's for a low strike, that's not enough reason yeah, there's for better me to, to, to be implementing it to my catchers ever. Yeah. I don't know. It just it looks funky. I haven't seen it work. I don't know what it does. I've seen a number of pass balls, and I've seen, like I said, I've seen four runs scored because of it. So, mm. Yeah, I'd be mad as a pitcher. Well, now, but we've talked about this too, and I don't remember how that works against a catcher. It's a wild pitch. Yeah, there's no errors given to a catcher, which I hate. That's the one rule I need to, that needs to be changed. I mean, if they're, you're going to keep dirt. seeing catchers go one knee, I mean, yeah, that needs to be fixed. Yeah. A pass ball should be an error. Yeah, for sure. Just some news, just some stuff out there. Uh, we haven't been able to talk about it lately. We had a basketball guest last time, and. Murdy, you were down to talk about some of it, but uh, yeah. let's get into you and your story here. Sounds uh, good. Madeira High grad, 2009, uh, part of a... 2008. O- eight, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, 07 track title with the, the that's Coyotes. Your, that's your favorite coach? Does he even remember when you graduated? I know, right? Yeah. Just Been kidding. doing it a long time, bro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, went on to Fresno Pacific University and was... Uh, 25th round pick by the Rockies in 2012. Played professionally with Tri-City, Modesto, and Asheville. Uh, in 2013, was a Northwest League All-Star. And uh, after his professional career ended, went on to coach at FPU for a handful of years. And uh, let's go right to there, man. Or, or to the beginning, sorry. Uh, out of Madera. And we've had some... Madera's got a great history of baseball. Um, you know, solid shortstop. Even as a sophomore, I remember... Uh, what was recruiting like for you? Uh, was was FPU because you kind of committed? Yeah, I committed. Little, uh, what fall of my senior year? I say it was, it was. Yeah, it's not as early as kids are doing it now. Yeah, I wasn't in eighth grade, um, <laughs> like most kids are now. Uh, no, but um, yeah, you know, recruiting for me at the time, you know, I was playing on a little travel team. There was a bunch of guys from all over. Um, coach Curran, who's now at Ohlone, was was my coach there, and it was so interesting. Cause I think the very first time he would ask us, like, "Hey, you know, we were sophomore juniors, pretty much in that travel team." He was like, "Hey, let me know where you guys want to be recruited, and I'll reach out." And so, like, everybody's thrown out. Oh, you know, like, I think I even did. I was like, "I want to go to Long Beach. I want to go to Fullerton. I want to go to Texas." Like, those are like my top three, because that's all you see. You know, you're watching College World Series, and it's like, I'm gonna go to Long Beach. Like, that's that's where my that's where all I see on TV. And so then it just became super apparent that I was like, that's, I mean, he was the first one to tell me like, Hey, I can reach out to the schools, but you're probably not going to, you know, get a call back. So let's have some backup options. So he started looking D2, D3s for me, um, did some visits down there, didn't went to Cal Lutheran. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, did a visit down there. Just wasn't for me. Didn't really like the, the, the campus. Just, it, it seemed all kind of just different for me. Um, and then FPU, came along and I had never honestly had never heard of Fresno Pacific in high school. I was like, I didn't even know there was another school in Fresno besides Fresno state. Um, and really it was just, it was coach Hirschkorn. Um, the things that I saw in him and, and the things that he said to me, um, was really what, what drove me there. And, uh, the staff that he had at the time, I mean, coach Sean Gilbert was an incredible, incredible hitting guy. And, and he was an infield guy and that's all I really want to do. I just wanted to play and feel like hitting to me was, was kind of secondary. Um, so with, with Sean, he was just kind of a guru, and, and I just wanted to soak up as much as I could from him. So that was kind of the main reason. I had some buddies that were going there too. So, um, But ultimately, just a, it was about fit. Um, from the very beginning, Hirschkorn gave me an opportunity and told me, you're going to have every opportunity to start. And that's really what sold me. I mean, that's what I wanted. I wanted to play immediately. I didn't want to go and sit behind somebody for two, three years and then maybe get an opportunity. I wanted a chance to play you know, from the get go. And that's, and that's what he gave me. Was Juco a, a thought? I mean, cause for that, you know, for some kids where they do have to sit for a couple of years, sure. 
know, maybe it's like, screw it. I'll just go to JC. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think Fresno city obviously was the big one. Um, at the time, Garrett Weber was the shortstop. And, um, if for anybody that knows Garrett, I wasn't going to beat him out. That guy's a stud. Um, so in my head it was like, well, I wanted to play shortstop. So it was like, I can go and play second base maybe, or, or you know, sit behind Weber and wait a couple years and then, and then play. So I wanted to play right away. So that was kind of the, the decision on that part. And, uh, I mean, talk about Oscar. I mean, we love him. We've had him on and, and he's done a fantastic job with that program, uh, and has built it up to what it is. And now division two, um, you know, they're, uh, the fields coming I mean, the field mm-hmm. beautiful. Um, and it's just, everything's just, it's continued to grow. It's not an overnight thing, but just talk about your time with him as your coach running the program and, and just kind of the things you learn and, and, uh, what helped you getting into pro ball? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of my career, I owed a, I owed a coach Hirschhorn. I mean, he, he taught me so much, um, in my four years there. And, and, and really, I mean, it was a lot about just how to be a man. I mean, he, he treats everybody in that program like an adult. And I think that's one of the biggest things is that he, he would constantly preach to us, Hey, my door is always open if you want to come talk, but you better be willing to, you know, get the answer. And I think that was huge. I mean, having him not just tell you what you wanted to hear or, you know, just kind of shoo you away when you had a question, he was going to give it to you. And, and he expected a lot out of us, but, um, that was kind of, you know, the main thing I learned from him was just transparency and, and being honest and, and, and hard work, um, was going to get you where you wanted to be. Um, and he, he was a, a great explainer, I think was one of the big things for coaches. I mean, I've had, a, I've had a lot of good coaches in my, in my career, but with him, it was always, Hey, I'm going to tell you to do something. And I'm going to tell you why I want you to do it. Um, which was different for me. I think there's a lot of coaches that just say, Hey, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to do it. And that's it. He was telling us on the back end, no, this is why we're doing it. Um, and he even allowed you as you got kind of more established in your career to kind of push back a little bit. You would have those dialogues in his office about, you know, I think I should be doing this. And he would say, okay, well, let's set up a plan that's going to get you to that point. I think we can do this better. It was always just a collaborative kind of process with him. And, and uh, that was huge. That was huge. Yeah, saying that too, you know, I think your time in Madeira, you had three head coaches. Yeah, yeah, I did. So it was yeah. something different, right? You had somebody S- some stability for yeah, sure. Consistent yeah, consistent to go. And to. they were, I mean, not that you had bad coaches. No, they were. I'm good. just saying yeah, that's hard. Mm-hmm. That's three different like programs, personalities, three different mm-hmm. cultures, mm-hmm. personalities, ways of coaching. And the cult. I mean, you say cultures. They were night and day. Yes. I mean, going from Zvorak to Patrick to McWhorter. I mean, every one of those guys, great, great humans, great coaches. Um, but they all brought something a little different to the table. So every year you were kind of trying to figure out where you stood with them um, and how you were going to kind of get used to them. That sucks too because there's some talented teams right there. I mean, obviously 07, you guys win a track title. Um, I think you lost at home to Clovis West. Yeah. We don't have to relive it. But Thanks, for bear. Yeah. That ball was jacked, by the way. I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so in 2012 – you go ahead and get drafted. And I don't know how many, at that point in time, how many draft picks FP you had. Um, just talk about getting drafted. You know, out of, and they weren't Division Two either. No, no. So NAI. what were you guys then? We were NAI. We were, my senior year was our last year being fully in the NAIA. So they were transitioning into Division Two. So I think that next year they were in um, the CC, no. I can't remember the league, but it was uh, like a Christian college right. transitioning right. Um, into D2. So they had to sit out for playoffs like a couple of years or whatever. So, um, but yeah, we were still, still NAI and still uh, battling out with Lewis and Clark and trying to de- dethrone them. But you guys, you guys went there, right? For the, yeah, my freshman year. Was Gosh. It? Yeah. That place is unbelievable. Um, Talk about that environment because that's kind of the, what's where it's hosted, right? Yeah, so that's that's where I think it's still there. I mean, I think they had like a deal where they the next like Northern 50 Idaho. years. Yeah, um, I mean, Lewis and Idaho. The only thing in town is Lewis and Clark, and it's an awesome school. Um, at that time, Ed Chef was the coach, and he was intense. Um, he had everybody scared of him. I mean, I was scared of him. I didn't even play for him, <laughs> but um, yeah, we oh, we did a four game series there, and we split with them, which was incredible and then we opened up opening night of the world series 
um, the NAI World Series, we opened up with them in front of like 7,000 people or something. And that was the most people I've ever played in front of um, at the time. And I remember just kind of taking it all in and being like, okay, this is, there's a lot of people here and, and they're, they're rowdy. They're all cheering for Lewis and Clark, but I didn't feel it until I think maybe like the second inning, some, one of their guys hit a ball in the corner, left field corner. And I went out for like a long relay and I could feel like people were so loud. I could feel like pressure on my chest. And we were thinking like, whoa, like this is, I don't know if I ever get any bigger than this. Like this is huge. But, um, but yeah, Lewis and Clark, that whole world series was a great experience. Um, and, you know, there's a reason they win it so many years. I mean, they're, they're a talented Even for you guys, that's a, the, the play in that environment. You know, one, it's an awesome memory that you have. Yeah, I mean, you go from FPU where there's like 60 people in the stands to, to 7,000. It's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. So do you remember draft day? I do, yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't cry. Don't cry. Uh, I won't. I won't. Um, yeah, so I think I watched the first, well, I mean, obviously you watch the first day and you see some of those guys and I mean, I wasn't, you know, crossing my fingers for the first day or, but I was thinking, okay, you know, just the people that I talked to, um, different scouts, they're like, all right, you know, we think maybe this round or we, we, we think you're going to go on this day. And so I'm just kind of waiting. Um, it didn't happen the second day. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I, I called up Matt Souza, who was our infield coach at the time. Uh, you guys know Matt. And, uh, I just, I was like, Hey man, I need, I need to get out of here. Like I need to, you know, come throw me some BP or something. So we went out to FPU and we hit for like the first, you know, half of the morning. And then, uh, my phone was right by me the whole time and nothing. So I'm like, you know, my rounds are getting worse and worse. Cause my phone's not ringing. It's like, all right, this may be the last time I'm ever going to take BP in my life. So finished up, still no phone call and, um, drove home waiting, you know, just having my phone by me. I think I pulled up right in front of my house and as I'm pulling up, Hirschkorn calls me and was like, hey, you, you did it. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, my phone hasn't. He's like, you just got drafted. And so I hear the line beeping on the other end. And sure enough, it was, uh, it was Gary Wilson, who, who's now with the, I believe he's with the Royals now, but he was with the Rockies then. He's the guy that, that drafted me. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't even remember the phone call. I just remember saying, thank you. Yes, I'll be there and hanging up. And then it was just, you know, going inside and getting mobbed by, by my family and my phone blowing up. But yeah, I, I had to get away from it. I couldn't, I couldn't sit around and just wait. I had to, to get out and it was good to take some BP that day and kind of get my mind off it. That's pretty cool though. You get, you know, you're at home when you get the call. Mm -hmm. So you get to go immediately tell the folks, but then you also get the call from your head coach Yeah, and uh, get that moment with him too. And, and you bring up Matt, um, you know, he did a lot of great things for, for her yeah. corner FPU. And did he recruit you? No, Matt was he recruiting was, at that time. No, my freshman year was Matt's junior year. Holy cow! Okay, so yeah. he got into coaching fairly quick after. Yeah, right after he graduated, yeah. he got into coaching. He probably um, came the grad assistant. And did yeah, it that way. Yeah, he was everywhere, man. I just remember seeing him. I mean, oh yeah, that guy no, put he, in some work. Yeah, he busted it, and yeah. I mean that. I mean the the class with Tristan Alvarez. Okay. I mean that was all him. Um, Ricky Garcia from from Redwood, Redwood and yeah. he had some guys. He had some guys, but yeah, he was, he was awesome. I loved, I mean, he was one of my favorite guys. Just, I mean, he would do anything for his, for his players. And um, that was huge. That was huge for us. So now we get into to professional baseball and I haven't really had these conversations with Chad and I, we probably should, cause I want to, I love to hear the stories, but you know, talk about minor league baseball, you know, as, and especially as a guy just grafted, you know, what is it like to show up to spring training I'm sure it's a little intimidating at first. Um, your surroundings, you don't know really anybody. Uh, and you're with some of the best baseball players in the world. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's all that. It's intimidating, um, you know, especially as a, a 25th round guy and you're coming out of college and, you know, you're hanging out with some 18 year old kid who just got, you know, four million in the bank and, and you just made 800 bucks or whatever, whatever your signing <laughs> bonus was. So yeah, it's, um, it's intimidating and you're meeting new guys and you're just trying to get acclimated to the, the organization. And you have a bunch of guys, you know, coming into town, all the Rovers and trying to learn a new system. And, um, I think my very first day I got moved to third base and they're like, all right, here are the signs. Like, cause they, all the signs go through the third baseman or whatever. And, um, I remember just being like, I can't do this. I don't know how to, I don't. I have to learn these things like today because the guys, 
you know, in my face saying like, you need to pick these up like right now. So, I mean, and then you have games like two days later. So it's, it's a lot. I mean, I think, and then on top of that, you're in a brand new city. Um, you don't know where you're going to live. Um, I mean, I think I was in a hotel the first couple nights and then I got set up with a host family who, you know, I still keep in touch with to, to today. Um, but, um, it can be a lot. I mean, you're flying over there and you don't know what you're going to be in for. And, um, I don't think there's really any training for it. I want you guys, cause I, I can't relate. I just I never experienced it, but I wonder how much like anxiety you guys develop from it. Like, have you noticed any changes since those? I mean, obviously you I may mean, get used to it, but did, did that, was that something that you initially noticed pretty quick? I mean, I, you know, Chad can talk about his experience too, but um, for me, I think, during the season, you get a little bit more comfortable once you, because you're just playing games. There's right. no, there's At no that real, point. It's the, it's yeah. just go play. I mean, when you're like farm director comes into town, there's a little bit, cause there's more eyes on you, but once, you know, game 40 of the season and you're just playing, it's not too bad, but, um, but yeah, there's something, I mean, I remember, you know, leaving for spring training, my first spring training, um, getting off the plane in Phoenix. It was like, as soon as that plane touches down, your heart kind of starts beating a little faster and, and because, I mean, spring training, there's everybody's there and everybody's watching you. So you just feel like even if you're not really a guy, you still feel like everybody's still watching you. Right. And so that's, yeah, I mean, you could definitely develop a little bit of anxiety or, you know, wanting to get off the field as soon as possible. And yeah, it's there's a lot of that. I think there's more pressure, to be honest. If you're a dude or you're a first rounder, what do you have to worry about? Right, right. You're pretty much tickets to the show. Mm-hmm. If you're a 25 or I was 42nd rounder, I'm playing for everything I have that day. Well, even I, at that, you I may, have to be on. It may not be right to the day. show. We've mentioned it a number of times. They're at least at, at the, invested in you. Right. Yeah. Right? So it's it's like, well, they're not going to just cut a dude they just gave half yeah. a million dollars yeah. to. No, that's a no. That's But they'll sure. cut a guy they, they gave a plane ticket to. Right. <laughs> here's another plane ticket. On day one. No, do, do they do that? Do they ever do that? Have you ever seen that? Like a day one sitting <laughs> packing no, bait? No, not unless you do something like. Yeah, I've seen, I saw we had a couple guys get cut, like maybe two, like like you know lower draft picks get cut. A couple weeks after, we had a guy. Um, we were going because we, in the Northwest League, you go to Canada, so there's a there's a border hop in there, and so you have to be in the and the Canada border is like pretty serious. I mean, I, yeah. I imagine every border takes their you know jumping every you know serious. But you do the whole passport check and they check you out and stuff. Well, this kid wrote his name down wrong on his passport, like he on his when he filled it out. So they sent him the wrong name and his name was Rodriguez and he spelled it with a Q. And they kept him in Canada for like two weeks going over all his background and stuff. And then he got back to the States and they cut him. So it was like your your time in pro ball was two innings in Canada. And then you just get you get cut when you come home. So of a typo. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That a G, a G kind of, you know, you close it it's, off. Yeah, you can close it off. Uh, but I mean, also like, like clubby stories, right? You know, and <laughs> just because I, those are fun to hear. I know Chad's told me some pretty good ones, but just the life on a bus, the, the <laughs> life in a shitty hotel or in an apartment with eight dudes on an air mattress with no food and, you know, I just, Talk about all of that, and then to have to That's play That's all baseball. the stuff you don't even think about. No, well, nobody talks up. about it. Right? You hear, you hear the the low pay. Yeah, right? that's been a topic brought up recent in recent years. But the living situation that some some like I know King of Juco on Twitter. Uh, Twitter, he went through a whole spiel on on his experience, and it's like, dude, it's mm-hmm. it could be pretty dark. Yeah. No, I, I mean, do you, have you seen Minor League Grinders on Instagram? I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's spot on because it all comes from minor league guys and, and, uh, the living conditions that they, they, they go through. But I mean, yeah, living conditions, even some of the ballparks is just, I mean, trying to take a shower and you're in like six inches of water around your ankles and <laughs> it's disgusting, but you're, you know, hey, you do what you it's gotta do. It's not just water either. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my, those, those little Latin guys. Get after <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard some of those stories as well. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, my first couple of years in the Northwest League, it wasn't too bad. It was it was a decent league. Um, but yeah, you definitely run into some some interesting Boise. clubbies. And Boise was tough. Yeah, at that time, um, Yakima had a team. And Yakima, 
They had one too, yeah, when I was there. Yeah, and that was a rough Were place the, to play. The D backs still? Yeah. And then they moved to Hillsboro and it's like the best stadium ever now. But um yeah, I remember uh in Salem Kaiser. You played in Salem Kaiser. I was there, yeah. Gosh, that place was like the meth capital of the world or something like that. I loved it there. Yeah, I I, I didn't do any meth either. I'm just, <laughs> I didn't. No, I mean between between some of the personalities you see in the clubhouse guys and they have their corks and um and then some of the fans like I think the most famous fan in all of minor league baseball is this guy named Toastman. Have you guys ever heard of Toast? So Toastman's yeah. in West Virginia. He used to be like the mayor of, of uh, this town in West Virginia, who's the Pirates Low A at the time, the Low A affiliate. Um, and he, he would bring a toaster to the game. And when you got to two strikes, he would get the whole crowd chanting, warm up the toaster, warm up the toaster. And he would put these toasts down in his, in his toaster and he would burn them. So the whole stadium started smelling like burnt toast. You get to two strikes and you're at bat and literally like you can smell it. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strike out. I'm going to strike out. This guy's going to. And as soon as you struck out, he would start chanting, you are toast. And he would throw toast to everybody in the stands. And they loved it. They, they, everybody wanted this free piece of toast. And it was burnt. It was burnt. And, but it just reeked. And so you'd be in the batter's box and you'd like, your first AB, you didn't know. So you just, you know, wear it. And then your next bat's like, all right, I'm not, I'm not getting to two strikes. So you'd be swinging at everything. And then by the seventh inning, you only have two hits on the board and this guy's laughing. And he was, he was crazy. But, he, you know, you run into these fans in minor league baseball that just, they're just, they just get after you. And I think that was the, one of the biggest things, you know, one of the adjustments coming from, you know, some of the NAI stuff. There's not that many fans there. And then you're going into, you know, places where the toast man is and you're just getting worn <laughs> out. I mean, he would literally stand up and, and, and yell out how much, like, your salary or your uh, signing bonus. Like, did you know? He'd have a microphone. Did you know that Alec Merton He's signed? allow everything at this ballpark. He signed oh, for $1,000? And it's like, thanks, dude. I didn't need everybody to know that, but appreciate it. He would go through your bio. I mean, he knew your parents' names. It was, yeah, it was tough. It was did tough. you ever, I had a, one instance that, and they did the beer batter of the game. Yeah. And you're the batter. If you strike out, everybody gets they free love beer. You. Yeah. So if you're that guy, <laughs> you try to do everything not mm-hmm. to strike out. And that, that even makes it worse because all the fans are against you. I was that one game <laughs> and I didn't strike out. I was, I loved it. Yeah. I might have gone 0 for 4. I don't remember, but I didn't strike out. And yeah. just, oh, they hated you. But yeah, but like you said, the chanting, like everybody's like chanting on you to strike out or like every pitch. And it's I was just, the, yeah, yeah. I, the beer batter thing's huge. Um, I played in a summer league. Um, I, my going into my senior year of college in the um, what is that? The Northwoods. Uh, I played for the the Green Bay Bullfrogs, and we went to Madison. And Madison's like the college town, so it's just packed every night. And they had a good team that year, but they did a thing called they had like every batter was like a different thing, and so I was the the hot dog hitter for the night, and they get like dollar hot dogs if they, if the guy strikes out. So after every pitch of the strike, the announcer would just lean in close to the mic and go wiener every pitch. And so you take strike one, he'd say wiener strike two wiener. And then, you know, you struck out and the crowd would just erupt. So that stuff, I mean, that stuff's fun. I think, I think can, that makes baseball too. Yeah. Like everybody talks about slowing the game down, but if you have mm-hmm. atmospheres like that, and that's what I love about minor league baseball compared to, Obviously, I didn't play in the big leagues, but going to a big league game. There's always something going on. Yeah. There's always something going on in a minor league game. There's always something in between mm-hmm. innings. And, and I think that, I think the big leagues should do that. I think it would make it more fun to yeah. be at a game. Or I mean, could you imagine 40,000 people? Yeah, toast, going on toast, <laughs> toaster. You know what I mean? Or like, you know, wiener. Yeah. Wiener. wiener. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. that. I think that's the. That's one of the great perks and about minor league baseball is the atmosphere was like fun. Even yeah. if you're an opposing team, it was still fun. What was your jersey situation like? You guys have clean unis or was it <laughs> trash? I mean, I think I wore pants from like 1970. Sick. They recycle. I mean, yeah, it. The uniform stuff. I mean, there's holes in them, and like, yeah, they all smell terrible because the club he didn't know how to use the dryer. We had a guy use. He washed our jerseys with fabric softener. Like after the game, he just loaded the whole washing machine, and it, they all stunk the next day. No was detergent, like, just no. Just hey, this this looks like <laughs> right. But see, that's like. another thing, right? You have these clubs, you got to pay these guys, yeah. right? and you already don't make any money. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do you have a clubby 
like an a, like an a, a, a dues clubby dues. Yeah, I mean, they, but they, I mean, a story where it's like this guy. Uh, would, I hear most of the yeah, good. We I hear mostly to, well, good we had ones. We pay opposing clubbies too. Yeah, when we yeah. went to opposing places, because mm-hmm. you have so your your park had your clubby that was with you at all times, but there was also an opposing clubby for the opposing team. So even when we'd go into a place, we had a clubby that was for the other teams. Right. So mm-hmm. we're relying on somebody that's on the other team to supply us with food and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so if for anybody that doesn't know... And you had a minimum what, what that is, you had to tip. What is the mm-hmm. job description of a clubby? They, so I mean, people, they, they so know. you have a, a pregame spread, um, sometimes a postgame. There was a guy in low A for the Giants that, like, there was an oven in our clubhouse, like, literally, like, a, like a gas oven, and he would make us, like, salmon, steak, and he, I mean, he charged, like, 10, 12 bucks, which was, he was doing, you know, a lot for us. So, I mean, those are rare, though especially at that level. I mean, most of the guys, they, they would lay out like, you know, some craft singles and like a, a piece of, you know, or a, a crock pot full of meatballs. And that was like your post game spread. So it's like, I'm, I'm going to give you two bucks. Like that's, uh, that's what I think you're the job that you're doing. But, um, so it's not a set rate. No, I, I think mean, at home there is. Yeah. At home there's a set rate for your guy, but I think on the road it's up to your discretion. Yeah. I mean, we would see five, seven a day, um, which is a ton when your meal money, I mean, it would just be a chunk out of your meal money, but yeah, that part, that part definitely wasn't glamorous. You guys learn how to, to manage bank accounts really well. Oh, man. That level, I bet. Yeah. Coupons. And but if you had a good clubby, they, you know, they'd go pick stuff up for you. Mm-hmm. They, they ask you what you want on the spread. So that way you have, everybody has a piece of what they want. Um, the shoes thing, if they clean your shoes, you know, and then you just do extra tipping for that kind of stuff. Cause at home you had a minimum, I think it was like 11 bucks or something. Something like, yeah, everybody was a little different, but, um, yeah, our home guy was always really good. Um, it's just the road guys that are best snow cone in the minor leagues. Try, try city. Really? I just, I <laughs> Come on, man. How did you not? How did you, you guys have the big, <laughs> you're going to make him mad now. Do you, did you guys not have the snow cone machine right behind home plate there? I never saw it. Dude, I think that was a visitor's thing. Huh. Going to places and going out to the, the on yeah. the on course or whatever. That's funny. Concourse. Best snow cones. Tri City. That's funny. Ultimately though. I gotta ask Lappin too, because I played against Lappin right. when he was there. So he I don't even know if he might know about I think him. you have actually. Because I, I don't I don't remember eating at our concourse when I at home. <laughs> so that makes sense, I guess. Do you remember Roofman at your con at your place? Uh uh-uh. uh. So maybe maybe it was after you, but um Salem Kaiser, their 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 toast man, um, it was called Roof Man. And so every seventh inning, there was a guy that would get on the top of the press box and he would like rain down CDs, like full <laughs> like full cased, and he would just start chucking them. And people would cover up and like if you didn't know it was coming, those things would start flinging, that's dude. Assault, and like oh my, dude. <laughs> What's he, that movie? That's uh, assault, brother. That's Billy Madison. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like a like a, a fun thing. It was like he enjoyed hitting people with these <laughs> Like these CDs. Right. It was, he where is this at? We're not going Salem there. Kaiser. Salem Kaiser. Kaiser. Yeah. No, no need to go the there. Volcanoes. Uh, it's not glamorous, right? Minor league baseball is. No, I mean, I think I, I think I shared in low A. I think I shared a two bedroom apartment with five guys. And uh, I was on an air mattress for five months. And yeah, I mean, they do. They, and they don't. That's the thing I don't think anybody knows is that you get there and you get like three days in a hotel, and they're like, "All right, they cut you loose, and they say go find a place to live." And it's like, I've never been here. I mean, I'm in North Carolina. You're on like, your own. Yeah. So, and they, I mean, they, I think every organization does a little differently, and and they help you in some ways. But for the most part, I mean, it's if you're an 18 year old kid trying to figure that out, I don't know. I don't know how you would do it. Do you look back now, and and maybe at the time there was some struggles, maybe? But do you, is it fun to you now when you go back and look at those? Oh times? yeah, I mean like, those are yeah. At the time, you're like obviously now you're being a dad and yeah, having the, a nine to five and at the time you're thinking, gosh man, I just woke up on a like a deflated like I'm, all, I'm literally on the ground now because my air mattress deflated in the middle of the night like this sucks. But looking back, I mean, you're getting paid even if it's just a little bit of money. You're getting paid to to wake up and go to the yard and play baseball. Like there's nothing better than that. Do you have any guys uh, going through the system that have uh, gone on to the big leagues? Uh, with the Rockies, mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, right now with the Rockies, McMahon. Okay. Um, 
he was, I played with him in Asheville. Um, David Dahl, when he was with the Rockies, now he's with Texas now. Um, Tapia, Raymel Tapia. Yeah, you could spend an hour on that guy. Um, <laughs> who else? My Well, my very first uh, rookie ball season, my, 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 the first two weeks I was there, Blackman was rehabbing with us. And Blackman's the coolest dude. I mean, what you see in his little, you know, the beer and the mullet and just... That's him. I mean, yeah, he I heard is, he's an interesting. I mean, you might think it was you might have told me he's mm-hmm. an interesting guy. He's awesome. He's awesome. He didn't talk a lot when we were there, but when he did, everybody would just like crowd around him. And and he, uh, the I remember the the one thing that he would tell us when we were hitting. I think it might have been like the first time he opened his mouth in the dugout. He was watching a guy hit in the game, and he was kind of it was a newer guy, so he was just you know kind of tense. And he was like, "Listen, guys, you want the key to hitting?" And we all kind of like crowded around him. He's like. You just got to be sexy. And we're like, what? Like, what? he's like, yeah, if you just, if you just feel sexy, three knocks. <laughs> and he was dead serious. And like, that was just him. He, he, you know, he knew how to have a good time, but he never took it too seriously. And he's a monster, by the way. Yeah. He's, he's a big man. But yeah, he's every now and then you get those interactions with guys in spring training where they would come up. Like Helton was a guy that liked to mess around with the Miley guys and, um, you get those interactions. It was it was good. Good memories, though. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not. It's just not a glamorous lifestyle. And I've heard, you know, I've heard Jason Donald talk about it and living on the road. And you know, as a guy that got to the big leagues, and you, know, you get there, and, and I'm sure Luplo's got some stories that we hadn't heard. And mm-hmm. you know, Marcus and, and Connor, and uh, we've had we've been fortunate. You know, Dylan. I'm sure there's some stories we need to get out of those guys if they ever come back on. But uh, you know, it's it's a job at that point. And, uh, you know, so the kids out there that want to play professional baseball. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what you're getting into until you get drafted and you get off that plane. Mm-hmm. And then your eyes are like, no, this is nothing like I grew up thinking baseball is like. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think, and I think I didn't realize that until kind of, I mean, obviously the, the first couple – months you're in it you're like man this is way different this is a different kind of baseball than I've ever played not just the level but just the the eyes and the scrutiny and and you have to perform or you know you're out um and I didn't realize that I don't think until it was over and I I vividly remember the day I got released um it was April 1st and because I remember the day before I was literally it's a shitty day to get released I know yeah, that's a bad day. The release day in spring training is the, the worst day. I mean, everybody's kind of on edge anyway. Yeah, but, but throw April 1st on that. I know. You know, like. Maybe yeah. maybe it was a joke. Maybe I'm still supposed to be there. Yeah, we should call somebody. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, re- I remember being, I got the day before, um, I was pulled up to AAA to play in like the spring training. We were at the Giants complex and we were playing um, on their, on the AAA field. And so it's a bunch of older guys and. You know, in the younger in the younger spring training with the low A high, everybody's just excited because you're not, you know, you're gonna go out and you're gonna play. And with the AAA stuff, it's like everybody's kind of playing for a job, so it's a little different atmosphere when you're playing with those older guys. And I remember um, Glenn Allen Hill was the was the manager, and and I remember going up to him and just saying like, hey, you know, introducing myself, and him just kind of being like, yeah, go go sit down on the bench over there. And it was like the sixth or seventh inning, I finally got to go in. Um, and I was replacing, I think the second baseman. So I got a couple innings and then it was my turn to hit in the top of the ninth. And there was some dude, like some big Dominican kid just pumping 98, like, and I'm in the bat, I'm in the on deck circle and there's two outs and I'm thinking, gosh, I don't want to hit. Like, I, I don't, I don't even want to take this at back cause I'm going to get my hands blown up. And we're thinking, please, like just let this hitter like just hit a weak ground ball or strike out. And then we can just go home and I can just be done with today and not have to hit. And sure enough, yeah, the guy strikes out and strike three, everybody packs up their stuff. And I didn't get it in a bat that day. Um, but then the next day I got released. So it's like, I don't think I really realized it until I left. It's like, man, your last chance to hit, you didn't even want to take the bat. And I think that's something that I took into my coaching was that you can't play this game scared. You know, the minute you do, the minute you should just stop. Hang it up. This game, you have to play free. You have to play loose. I mean, yeah, there's pressure, but you got to figure out a way to 
get away from that pressure and just kind of take a step back and, and think, why, why am I nervous? What's the worst that can happen? I get out. Okay, great. Everybody gets out. And I think I lost that, um, kind of that last spring training. So really, I mean, did I want to continue to play? Absolutely. I think everybody wants to play until, until they can or can't, you know, any do it anymore. But I think my mentality shifted and that's when it was time for me just to take a step away. And coaching was a huge blessing. Uh, I think it unlocked some things inside me that I didn't know. I didn't know I had, but, um, yeah, I don't even know how I got off on a tangent there. But. Nah, that's, that's great. <sighs> that's tough, dude. Yeah, no, it was it was a it was a weird time, you know, going through because you play your whole life and you never think it's going to end. And when it does end, you're like, well, what was that? Like now what? Um, but to do it in that way, it took a lot of reflecting and just, you know, kind of coming to terms with my career and, and what it was and, and how it ended. But um, ultimately, I mean, there's no regrets. I, I think I enjoyed every every season I had. I enjoyed it. You know, getting into the coaching side of it. Um you know, obviously taking that lesson, um, that's, that's so valuable to have. Um, I'm glad that people get to hear that because I think any, you know, as a coach, I'm going to use that story. Um, I think Chad will probably use that story in the future. If coaches that listen to this, use that story. That's man, that's just so truth and and real. And kind of gave me chills right there. Like that sucks. That's, but it's also true. And it's going to end. Um, but then getting into coaching and being able to, you know, learning how to recruit, you know, and that was kind of one topic I wanted to hit on. <clears throat> you have to compete with junior colleges, mm-hmm. you know, and you're, you're obviously competing against Fresno state. Uh, when you got into recruiting and, and coaching with Oscar, you know, what was one of the things you learned and how to deal with all the, all there is to offer baseball players around here? Yeah. I mean, I mean, luckily we, we have such a big market here. I mean, there's so much good talent here, you know, whether you're going South Valley, North Valley, I mean, so there's a big pool, um, and not everybody's going to go D1. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me was just being, being honest with guys. And, you know, I think it's about finding that right fit. And so when you're identifying guys and, and, you know, you never want to tell a kid, Hey, you're not going to go, you're not going to be D1. Like that's just not a good way to recruit. Um, but I think it was it was letting them know how they fit into our plans and being honest with them, being realistic. Like, hey, I see you. You know, we we tried to recruit a lot of speed. That was kind of like our our, our thing that we hit on. Um, and then we would place those guys as we saw fit. So, um, but I think it was just kind of getting a plan and and filling those pieces and finding out. Hey, you know, I think you could be a guy for us at short because, you know, like with Tristan. He, we weren't going to get another shortstop. Like we weren't going to recruit another shortstop because we had Tristan. Nobody's going. I mean, he could he could be in in the minor leagues right now as a fielder. Um, should be. Yeah, yeah, he should be. Um, so with recruiting, it was just like, hey, let's go find a guy that can play second base and play it really well. And if there were a shortstop, then we just had to be honest with him. Hey, you know, we have a guy and he's really good. So you know, what are your thoughts on second base? And for me. I could tell that story easily. Like it's one thing for a coach to say like, Hey, you're a shortstop right now, but we need you at second base. And if you're a shortstop in high school, you're saying, well, what, wait a second, I'm a shortstop. But for me going from the pro ball side, I saw it. Hey, you're, you're a, you're an infielder. I mean, I played short my whole life and then I get to, to rookie ball. And all of a sudden I have to learn how to play second. I have to learn how to play third. I have to learn how to play first. I mean, you're just, you're just a player. Um, unless you have, you know, a lot of money and in, invested or whatever. But so for me, I approached it in a way like, Hey, what else can you do? If you want to be valuable, like hopefully your dream is to play pro ball. Are you better than, are you better than Trevor story at short? If not, then you need to learn how to play another position. And that was kind of the, what I preached to my guys when I got them in the program, it was like, you know, we need you to do a couple of different things. And because the more you can do, the more valuable you are. I mean, there's only nine guys that get to play and, you know, not everybody's going to hit 400. So you got to learn how to contribute somehow. So yeah, but if you could supplement off days with the same guy at multiple positions, yeah, that's huge for an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is there, I know you're not coaching now. Is there, is there coaching in the future? Maybe you think about getting back into, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I definitely, you know, you get the itch around this time when you see spring training going on and high school games starting and, and, you know, colleges and stuff. So, I don't know. I mean, I got a little one now, so maybe I'll hold out till uh, yeah. 
But I don't even know about that. I don't know if I can coach my own. <laughs> I might have to just keep it's it It's always a challenge, I hear. Yeah. You know, I want to finish with this. Um, you know, you got to play for for Oscar, and, and uh, what was the difference maybe coaching with him that you didn't see as a player? Yeah. Um, I think a lot. He's, he's one of the funniest dudes I think I've ever met in my life. Um, and he's just easy to talk to. And I don't think I got that as a player. I think it was more, you know, you have that coach player relationship and, and maybe you don't want to cross certain lines or, or anything, but, um, I got to see a little glimpse of, of him as a dad, um, him as a husband and, and, you know, it's kind of some things outside of, of baseball. Um, I just learned a lot about him as a human being. And I think, um, that was mainly what I took from it. It just, it just deepened our friendship. I mean, we, we talk, you know, regularly and, and we keep up on each other. So, um, I think that was, was huge for, for getting to see him outside of just the coaching world. You, know? yeah. you get to see the, the work it takes, mm-hmm. the work he puts into the program. Cause when you're out there as a player, you only see him as a coach. You don't see him as a dad and a husband. Yeah. And, and no, and, and Hirsch was a whole other life. And he was great in the fact that like, he just let you, like he hired you to do the job. And he just said, do it. I mean, it wasn't, he wasn't going to micromanage you and tell you, no, you're not, you know, this is, this is how you do it. If I had infielders, then I had infielders. I mean, that was kind of, that was my, my world. Um, you know, the recruiting stuff went through me and, you know, I had to ask for his approval on a lot of stuff, but, um, that's where he was great is that he really let you get your hands on and, and learn, um, on the fly. And, and that was huge for, for my development as just a person, I think. Well, like I said, we go back a long way. It's just cool to see full circle, see you grow up. Now he's a freaking dad. He was 13, and now he's a dad. It's so weird to see. <laughs> I've had a lot of players just they have their own lives now. It's just crazy. But uh, thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, it's uh, been it. a long time. We talked about this a long time ago. When we started this, you would hit me up on your drives, and uh, I, I appreciate all that and the reaching out that you did. And uh, just thanks for coming on, man. It was good to talk yeah, to you. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And then this, I mean, you guys, what you guys are doing here, this is – I think a lot of people enjoy it. And, and I mean, this is a baseball rich community and even with Chris Heron, I mean, the, the guys that you get, you're getting, I mean, the stuff that guys are listening to and learning from you guys, it's awesome. So All I right. appreciate you guys for doing this. No, I appreciate you, that. But, uh, yeah, this was fun. Yeah, man. It was some good stuff. It brought there. back some memories. Yeah. We'll kind of move on shift from the basketball side of things. Right. Which we was great it. though. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that, you guys having me on after Chris Heron. That's a, uh, you know, <laughs> That was that was the first <laughs> thing I said when I talked to him. I was like, um, "So yeah, we, you know, we, Chris Heron. I saw you got Chris Heron. Yeah, it was it was awesome. It was a lot of fun." He's like, "Hey, do you do you want to come on next? <laughs> what, come You're gonna see your ratings go from there. <laughs> come on next. No, no we're back to baseball. <laughs> yeah, it's baseball season. That, that was just uh, but that was Chris awesome. Heron. It's just you know his I story. Mean, that was I listened to that one because I was I mean I was way younger than you guys when when he was you know at Fresno State, but I still remember. I mean, I remember getting the Fresno B and having those posters in there and cutting them out and putting them on my wall and, you know, Terrence Roberson and Chris Heron. I mean, pff. so that was awesome that, you know, just to listen to it. it was, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. Stuff. Yeah. So, and, and I, you know, I didn't, I haven't announced it yet, but it's looking like we might get a part two of that. So sometime Sweet. in the near, near future, we'll have to figure out the time, but yeah, awesome. it's, it's already been okay. I just got to book it. So cool. But anyways, thank you, my brother. It's good thank to, you guys. good Appreciate to see it. you. And, uh, Chad, you got any anything else for my buddy here? No, he hates yeah. it when I do that, bro. <laughs> yeah, so let's go back to uh, <laughs> your T-ball team was the, the no. Top. Again, I appreciate it too. It's a lot of fun. Uh-huh. I love getting, uh, I love talking minor league baseball, and because that's I was minor leaguer, so just the memories and stories. So Absolutely. and we played in the same league, so it, yeah, I know where yeah. a lot of the stuff you were at. You guys can relate on that stuff. Yeah, yeah one hundred. And I, they're great stories. I love to hear them. I, I want to hear them. We've got to do one day where just, that's all we do. We just do one just big minor league episode and just get the stories. Yeah. Get I mean, I would, I would love to tell my story, but I don't, I don't think people want to hear my story out there. Well, we're going to have to get to it. At some point, we got to get to it. Yeah, absolutely. Because doing this, like doing this, like Murdy didn't know exactly everything we were going to talk about. So ask, mm-hmm. being the person that asked the questions... I've thought about all the questions that we've always asked and have all these stories and memories. So I was like, yeah. I'll have to interview you one day. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get somebody from the, yeah. Somebody come interview us. Yeah. That's in the works too. We'll talk about I that. I like but, it. Yeah. But uh, again, thanks Marty. And, yeah. No uh, problem. 
That's the Hit or Die podcast. Alec Merton. Hit or Die.